Roy Crown from Revelation Trust and welcome to Gospel Entrepreneurs. In this podcast, I'll speak to leaders in the church, community and business who are using their entrepreneurial spirit to share the good news of the gospel wherever they find themselves. In today's conversation, I'm joined by Elijah Kirby, who spoke to me from his home in Middlesbrough. Elijah's story is one which many of us can relate to about what happens when things don't work out as you think they're going to be. I'm thrilled on this podcast to have my great friend, Elijah Kirkby, who lives in Middlesbrough and has got a a varied life. He's married. He's got four children. uh, He's a great guy, even though he lives in Teesside. Please welcome Elijah. Hey, hey, Roy, what an introduction. It was like the highs and the lows. It's like being on a roller coaster. It's like the ups and the downs. So <laughs> it's a bit like your life, Elijah. It's a bit like what you've walked through. But let's start. We first connected when you were a teenager, didn't we? Yeah, we did. So you were the National uh, Director of Youth for Christ and you were speaking at an event. I had kind of got a free ride there to this Christian youth camp. I took a bottle of vodka and some condoms, age 15. And I thought it's going to be carnage for this week. I went there, gave my life to Jesus on the first night for this gospel call, met Jesus in the most amazing way. Uh, anyway, the second night, you come onto the stage. and But for me, being unchurched and watch someone so amazingly and eloquently communicate a gospel of hope, I was just, I was like, who is this guy? Like, he's so confident. Like, how does he stand in front of all these people? You were leading you for Christ. And I, I, pretty quickly, I decided that I wanted to leave my education. Uh, this is college, which you opt in for. And I wanted to tell people about this Jesus that, that I'd encountered myself. And I had a conversation with you. You said, yeah, we're recruiting people. And I joined you for Christ. And that was it. But I was really inspired. And, and hopefully you didn't drink the vodka or do anything else that you planned to go with the camp. <laughs> Exactly. It was just amazing, isn't it, how God intervenes. And uh, it was interesting. There was this guy called Mike Pilavachi who was at Speak on my first night there. And I was I pushed my way to this front of the crowd. And uh, I mean, just, just looking back, I was thinking, who was I? Pushed my way to this crowd, stood in the front of this music event, which I thought it was. That's what the youth worker build as, this music event. Like the music, this guy on stage winked at me, came off stage at the end and said, God's told me all about your life. And I'm like, what the heck have I come to here? Anyway, the things he shares, I'm thinking, he must have been stalking me for 15 years. How on earth does he know all of that? I mean, it was detail. And that was just that enough to, to pry something open in me where I thought, well, if there is a God, I want to know. I went back to the front of the crowd, put my hands in the air. That's what everyone was doing. And the most explosive meeting with the creator of the universe. Just amazing. We would call it deliverance now, wouldn't we? I felt like there was this power wash on my soul that was being cleaned. It was incredible. And so it was that real encounter. But God used yourself and Mike in that situation to really, uh, I was lost. I was kicked out of school. Police were involved. Um, I was on a one-way street, I think. There was all sorts going on at that point in my life. And it was just that summer that transformed me. It's amazing to hear the story of God transforming lives, Elijah. It's just amazing. And, and, it's so encouraging that you have some small part in people's lives at that point. But we've grown a lot closer over the years, Elijah. So fast forward a little bit. You're married now. You have four children. Is that right? Yeah. Three, three boys yeah. and a girl? Yeah, that's right. Married to Joe. And yet we live in Teesside, which is a brilliant place. We've got beaches, hills, valleys, reservoirs. It's gorgeous. <laughs> And um, and so married to Joe, being married 13 years, got four children. Oldest is nine, youngest is two. Uh, and it's just, it's a blast. But we have grown close to Roy. And uh, you, I'm going to say this because you can't stop me, but and you don't like the, the tag, but Roy, you've been mentoring me for a number of years, I would say. And what I mean by that is what I've always spotted in you, Roy, is this, this pastoral heart, but almost this desire to recreate evangelists across the nation who, who are living out in their contexts the... I want to transform what I'm doing. I want more people to encounter Jesus. It's got to be for a purpose what I'm living out for. And we met again when I was heading up the UK partnerships at Tear Fund. 
and we we tried to um, to form some partnerships on on several occasions and work together, which we did. And um, we loved gathering people across various cities in the UK, and we had loads of fun, which I loved. But also with you, Roy, especially as this call of my life, I believe, came into play to create something that would ripple across the nation in various contexts and locations. I think I asked you at one point, I was on a flight home with a friend of ours, and I said, I think I need a mentor in my life who can help me you know, live this out and model this across the UK. Someone who's scaled something before, which, Roy, you have. And he said, who are you thinking? I said, I've been praying the last couple of weeks, and the only person I can really think of, I can't not stop thinking about is, and he said at the same time, Roy Crown. It was like this brilliant affirmation, 35 feet, 1,000 feet in the air. We were like, Roy Crown. So I came back, we met for breakfast. And I asked you, I said, you know, would you journey with me over this period of unknown, but also brilliant expectation? And you said yes, which has been an amazing privilege for me. Yeah, and it's been an amazing journey. Just step back a bit from that. But because before you were with Tear Fund, you were a vineyard pastor. Didn't you kind of plant a church and plant a church in London. You've always kind of innovative and creative. It's kind of the entrepreneur within you. Give us give us those two stories, Elijah. Yeah, I think, Roy, I've been listening to your podcast and I think what every person listening to this will recognise and nod with me, hopefully, and agree with is that it doesn't just happen at a stage. There are telltale signs before that where you give things a go in the secret. And often when you're younger, they aren't the right reasons, but it's that gifting that's that's murmuring in you. And so for me, I remember hustling, I, w- I would call it, aged 13, 14, 15. I wasn't brought up in the gangs of New York or anything, but hustling ways to make money to, you know, sell at school or to, I had a paper round at the time to earn a little extra on the top. You know, some of those endeavours weren't, there was no integrity in them, but but you look back, you think, well, there was something in me that was yearning for something else. And so I think there's always been that ability in me to see something, whether that's a foolish trait or not, to give it a go and to think, well, that's where I can see myself and I, I want to see something happen. So, of course, when you encounter Jesus, that same thing, that same cause in your life. But of course, you want that that same experience to be multiplied for him. And so that encounter in that field at age 15 has really been the significant golden thread. Because in that moment, and it was a moment, I recognized that Jesus was alive and that he he can transform my life That in all of its quirks at that moment, in that instance. He can also do it in a relevant way for everybody else. And so everything I've done from that point has been with that intention. How can I create places for Jesus, uh, for people to encounter Jesus in places that are relevant for them? I started in youth work and you, you you kind of, you're growing that. People think this boy's got leadership. Then you start leading teams and organizations and budgets and all of that. But then ultimately I'm thinking, I'm getting a bit old. I was in my twenties. I'm thinking, I'm starting to get people in the pub. I'm starting to, you know, on the football field, how can I create a place for them to encounter Jesus? That's not just young people. So you think, well, maybe a church set up where they can all pile in will be good. And I think ultimately through the hustling, about the time of the Olympics, the Americans were going nuts for London. They all, you know, it was the centre of the universe, wasn't it? And so there was a couple of big churches over there, mega churches, we would call them, about 25,000 in weekly attendance, who wanted to do things outside of the state to approach Joe and I and said, could you could you do something in London with us? And after a while, we said, we said, yep. And we launched in East London. We knew nobody. And we thought, well, how can we reach East London for Jesus? And so in my head, I thought, I've got to start to gather the gatherers. Who are those people that people want to be around? Can I invite them around for a meal? And can we create something? And so in week one, classic story, all the church planters are agreeing. We had eight people. Week two, we had three. It was brilliant. But week four, we had six. And within within six months, there was 40 to 60 people meeting in our front room. There wasn't room for people. And on the back of that, we launched this church in East London. Again, the intention, how can people meet Jesus who would never experience him in any other, any other walk of life and make it relevant for them? And it was incredible. But And when I look back at the ingredients of that, I sometimes think, what were you doing? We hired the largest venue in East London and then we gave ourselves six months to fill it. And for some reason, that didn't even dawn on me that I might not fill it until the night before the launch of this church where I walked past it on a prayer walk and said, God, you know, I pray with us and this, this place is filled. But then looking up at this building and continuing to look up at this building and thinking, what have you done? I can't believe it. What have you done? 
Why didn't I didn't even think about it? And amazingly, it was overflowing. But it's not always a success, and we'll come on to that. But I think that that drive and ambition, and then from then, yes, uh, Joe and I were asked to, to lead a vineyard church that was it was struggling, people falling out over the colour of the wallpaper and all sorts. So we, you know, <laughs> we stepped in, and, and you know we loved it. And but again, within that, how do you innovate and create? But it's always for me got to be about people encountering Jesus. Otherwise, what's the point? I mean, you can make millions or you can recreate streams or reinvent systems. That's great. But what's the outcome? It reminds me of Solomon jotting down, you know, you can have all of this stuff, but ultimately, isn't this the stuff that's at the core? That's always been the thread and it always will be. And obviously, it was the link, Vineyard, Teesside, the church in London, for all sorts of reasons, that kind of changed. Then you had a season in Tear Fund uh, where you're working in a corporate and all of that. But in your DNA, right back at the start, there was something about the care system because you'd been brought up in it and something about that that just wouldn't leave you, would it? It was like God we now look back and say God had placed that in you and all those other things, transformational gospel, but there's something in you that, that was a music that just wouldn't die. And give us part of that, Elijah. And even though you did all these other things, that was still there, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and you know what? I didn't know it for a long time. And so that music stopped for a long time. I left, I was brought up in the care system. Um, and ultimately after, a, a, a harrowing start I ended up with this angel of a lady who loved me unconditionally and it was her love and the support of a local church that I would say transformed my entire life and story without a doubt incredible and so I thought every child in the care system left just like me having encountered ultimately along the journey some sort of love and affirmation and change and I know you're probably thinking that's naive. I just did. I switched off from it. I got into leadership, led the churches, the corporate, had a few other things, lived life. But then when I was leading at Tear Fund, a bunch of friends about the same time, they said to me, you know, the care system nationally is in a real pickle, don't you? And honestly, I said, is it? You know, I was in there ages ago. I thought it was all fixed and sorted. And I started looking at the stats nationally and, uh, and I was moved emotionally. I remember driving in the car one day, just crying my eyes out thinking, how is this going to change for, you know, there's tens of thousands of me's out there stuck in these locations who are never going to encounter Jesus, which is the secret ingredient. Good social work's okay, doesn't do it. You know, just a nice environment doesn't do it. How do we transform hearts and lives? And, and thinking, what can I do? That's, you know, what, what are the craziest prayers I've ever prayed? Thinking, what can I do? And I thought, I, I wonder, I wonder if we, we can reawaken this idea of every child encountering love and encountering Jesus. And perhaps they're the same in some situations, but a loving earthly family and a loving heavenly father, how can we bring those to light? And uh, and that really brought something up in me where I thought I've got to do something. I've got to create and innovate. And, and the system's stale. I was gobsmacked. I looked and I thought, surely everyone's doing this. I did two years of research. Roy, you were with me on that. There's a team with us on that. We looked and spoke to lots and lots of leaders out there, well-respected people. And the unequivocal answer back to us was, no one's doing what you've proposed. And we were flabbergasted. And we thought, what? Like, this is standard stuff. And so we dreamt up a model. We put it together. We took it to some funders. We raised some support. We employed a team. We put everything around it to, to really make that vision a reality. And, uh, and then we launched literally the month of COVID and the world stopping. And the last three years, we, we navigated that whole journey there. I mean, what a journey. But yeah, looking at my own life, thinking this is where I've been. This is my experience. God, I think this is your heart. I think this is my background. I think we're hearing yeses all over the place. This has got to be your will. And taking a big risk, you know, I'm not a career bod. But pausing the career, you know, stepping out of a role that, that was a good role, I was happy there. I would say put, putting it all on the line for something I really believe fundamentally in. Which stepping is what out. entrepreneurs do. They kind of, they take the risk, they step out because they believe I've seen a need, I'm going to do something to change it. And I think more than that, Roy, yeah, I mean, totally, but more than that, now I've seen it, I can't unsee it. So, you know, 
I, I can't go to sleep knowing that, that that could be a possibility and and I can I can change something significant there potentially. So and that was the issue. Once I'd thought of it and everyone said we're not doing it, I was like, this is crazy. You know, this has got to be done if we're going to change something. And then and then we launched the organization. We uh, I'm not a social worker, but we uh, recruit the social work team. We uh, had everything in place, getting ready for Ofsted to come and check us out. Ofsted were a year delayed. That cost us a hundred grand just waiting for Ofsted because of their delays, because of COVID. You know, and so suddenly enter this arena where you're thinking there, there are so many unknowns. We believe the core mission, but ultimately we've got some obstacles now. How do we overcome which we all face? How do we overcome these? Because we still want the primary thing to be the main thing. So let's go for that. Well, the reality is. It didn't happen. So sometimes people listen to this. We always hear the success stories. We always think, hey, if God's in it, it's all going to fly. It's all going to make that. It doesn't mean God's left you. It doesn't mean, but there were a number of factors. But talk us through how you felt when, because of all sorts of things, Ofsted, also, it just, North Point Care is not now in existence, Elijah, is it? Yeah, that's right. And and I think you've got this one track where you're thinking, if God's in it, this is going to work. And that's your theology and your thinking and your belief. And I would always admire that and go for it. Then you've got this other thing that's saying, well, this is reality and this isn't working. Like, you know, God, you can make this, this work right now if you want to. You know, what what's missing here? And so you do the whole, I repent of sin. You know, is it me, God? <laughs> Is it me? I lay it on the line again for you. You know, you are constantly hustling, thinking of various scenarios to try and make this work and, you know, move things and create things. But ultimately, when you're in a, a setup where there's a statutory governing body that say computer says, no, this is not happening, you can't really do much about that. And so a part of all of that, yeah, there's there's grieving. There'll always be grieving because I, ca I can't unsee what I saw and that still needs to happen. But ultimately, that's been the journey. And God is still the same. You still trust him. You do grow. It's all a cliche. But there's things you learn, the things you grow, how you are stretched. And, and, and what I would say is this. Even though I took a leap of faith or a step of faith and it didn't pan out how I thought it would, I've seen the golden thread of God's providence and goodness right throughout it. I mean... I won't share the stories but and the details, but personally how, you know, we've been caught and secured. And just those amazing wild stories of God while wrestling with the, so why didn't this work? And and you even won an entrepreneur's award, didn't you, by the government? <laughs> well, it's always been on my board for the last three years and the team there have been brilliant as a confidant, advisor, critical friend. And the, the morning I gathered the board to kind of say, guys, we've explored every option. This is not working, sadly. I got a, a random email saying, you've been nominated and shortlisted and you're a finalist for the Great British Entrepreneur Awards uh, of the year for the award for good or whatever. And so it was like Instagram versus reality. Everyone's like, oh, my days, you know, what's Elijah bubbling on with? And I'm thinking, like, I'm, I'm meeting my board to close this thing down. You know, there's a grieving process. We want to get you on the stage with the, you know, the, the Emmys of uh, entrepreneurship, they call it, these awards. It's just interesting, isn't it? An award for what? It, it, it was an idea. It was a good idea. But I'm really pleased and I'm really proud of the whole team that we had the guts to go for it. We stepped out. And that's massive, Roy. Because I think there's two things that happen when you take a risk and it doesn't work. You can either promise yourself it's never going to happen again and you're going to play it safe from now on, or you make a commitment to trust God and say, yes, next time he asks you, ask you to jump. And I've committed to that. It's cost me. But I only see this tiny bit of the picture and I know there's all this other stuff to go. It's just interesting. And so I think being a risk taker and looking and leaning into opportunities and trusting God is still the key thing. Yeah. And as those of you listening, the reason I wanted to talk to Elijah is he's truly a gospel entrepreneur. It's in his DNA back in the day when he was trying to make money on papers and paper rounds and whatever. Passionate for the gospel. It doesn't always pan out as you think, but there's a bigger story. And in the bigger story, Elijah's still trusting God, still looking for the next step. But this one, didn't happen as we all 
believed and dreamed it were going to be. But Elijah and I are still friends. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you're laughing. We are. I mean, that's just the... <laughs> oh, yeah, massively. And Young Life still going for it, still looking for transformation, still wondering what that in the care system that's in his life is still in there. So how that's going to work out, who knows? But I hope you've enjoyed this Gospel Entrepreneur podcast. It's been amazing to work and journey with Elijah. And I just want to encourage you, those of you listening, whatever situation you may find yourself in, if it's flying, great, That then praise God, carry on. But if it's not working out because you're dealing with bigger issues, bigger bodies, other situations, God is still with you and in it. Push mm. on and you never know. But if, if you reach a point where it doesn't, doesn't mean God's quit or God's left you. He's still on the throne, still at work. Trust him and move on and learn. Elijah said, learn some big lessons, right attitude, right spirit going forward. Elijah, any final word that you want to say to the people listening in wherever they're at? The best book I've ever read on leadership in the last, in the last three or uh, four years is by uh, the Nike founder, Phil Knight. Read it, get it. And, and what's amazed me by that is the ups and the downs for years and years and years, but how his persistent passion and consistent passion uh, never changes. And ultimately how he reaches that goal, almost bankrupt a number of times. I won't spoil it for you, but I just think it's an, an amazing picture of how we expect overnight success but there's more at work than just your project and God's kingdom is doing his thing. And just to be encouraged in that, it's it's been very helpful for me. Elijah, that alongside the Bible is all good stuff. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> and uh, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks, Elijah, for joining us. God bless us. Thanks, Roy, for having me. Elijah's got an amazing story of... Just the transformation that happened at that teenage camp and to see God at work in his life. But not all of the things we do are success stories. And I was particularly impacted by Elijah's attitude and spirit in what he'd learned through setting up North Point Care and then it not happening as he would like. Let's not think that everything will be a glowing success, but let's remember that God is with us and working in us and through us. I'll be back with another Gospel Entrepreneur next week, but you can catch up on all the previous conversations I've had on the UCB Player app and wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening today. Gospel Entrepreneurs is a UCB podcast in partnership with the Revelation Trust. Mm-hmm.